Hi, this is Becky Mayer, and you are welcome to come to Transitions Body, Mind, Spirit. In our show, I like to use the metaphor of triathlon, something that I do. And the first thing you do when you're in a triathlon, you swim. And then you get into a transition area, and then you get on the bicycle. And then after you bike, you go transition again and run. And so this is a metaphor for what we do in our lives. We start out at one thing, one idea, what we're, what we're going to do, and transition into various things until uh, we, we're in something that we never even dreamed of. And today we have our guest, Ben Vincent. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here, thank you. Ben is a, not only an amazing trumpet player, but, <laughs> but also uh, an amazing uh, cyber scientist, would we, we might say, a security cyber person. And uh, it took a, a little bit of a transition for you to get to that. And also, we'll talk about Bitcoin and all kinds of other things, too. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. Okay. Was it in Michigan that you started uh, your yeah. life? I was born in Michigan, in Pontiac, Michigan. And uh, my family moved to Hopkinsville, Kentucky when I was about four years old, I think. We lived in Kentucky until... Uh, I turned 18. After I graduated, I said, I got to get out of the state. I want to go back to where it's busy and, and oh. not country. And I didn't like country music. I know I live in Nashville, but um, <laughs> I had a hard time with it. So uh, I was fortunate in high school. My band director um, had introduced me to jazz. And so I jazz. loved jazz. Uh, my early goals were actually to possibly go to New York and play in the jazz clubs. Um, but that wow. kind of uh, disseminated and I faced a real world. Uh, I was married when I was 19. Mm -hmm. We've been married 38 years. Wow, congratulations. And, uh, so wow. uh, we have two children and um, we lived in Michigan for about 25 years. Uh, we moved down here about in, in 19, uh, I believe it was 89 and 90. Uh, but the economy wasn't stable, so we went back to Detroit. And then we moved back down here when my uh, sons were in high school uh, because we wanted to get them away from the big city and everything that was going on there and, and get them founded. And so uh, we both agreed that Nashville was the place we wanted to go. And um, I had a friend that owned an IT company here, and he and I had been talking, and I sold a company in Detroit and came here and ran his firm uh, for a few years and then kind of transitioned away from running it into more of just working there. But I still had a desire to be the chief instead of one of the Indians. And he knew that and we kind of worked out um, a package and I was able to leave and uh, take some time off, uh, probably about seven or eight months. And then I came oh. back to uh, work and, and started a, a company up and and uh, took off from there. We've been doing it now uh, almost uh, six and a half, seven years. So tell me what your IT company does. And we we do a lot. Um, we try to cover everything, all inclusive um, requirements for our customers. We uh, do one thing. We do is we go into. Um, a client site, and if they've got a server, a physical server in their office, um, then we work with them to transition that to a cloud. Uh, we, we have a very unique uh, cloud. Um, we have a location downtown, but we also have two uh, undisclosed locations where our data flows to uh, for redundancy oh. to uh, back it up. Um, and when we have a server online, not only does that customer get our backups of their server, but we have ultimate uh, backups running in two different directions mm -hmm. so that if ransomware hits and somebody steals their data and wants them to pay for it, then we can take that data and restore it without having to pay the ransom. That's <clears throat> a great idea. It's that is a great idea. Are, is that what everybody's doing? Unfortunately, no. There's a lot of people that get um, ransomware and there are 
firms that they think one backup will do. And so they just back their stuff up mm -hmm. locally in their local data center. And uh, we get calls on a regular basis of we've been hit, you know, what can we do? Now, it depends on the variant, <coughs> and the variant means what version of uh, ransomware was hit. And if it okay. was one that's been out for a while, then we can decrypt it and give them their data back. Uh, if it's a brand new one, and it changes every day, hmm. um, then the brand new variants we may not have as much success with. Um, so we find a way to, A, either negotiate with um, we call them cyber terrorists or wow. uh, we, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to, to, to call them. Um, but we, we begin the process of negotiation, finding out what it would cost and, you know, then either retrieving the data or find out if, you know, is it really worth it? We, we hope, and we're trying to, we've got a campaign going that we're trying to educate the public. Look, it, it's not a matter of if, but when, and when it does hit, mm -hmm. Um, you need to be prepared. And so we have had our first episode with it uh, was um, when we lived in Detroit. We, besides our IT firm, we owned uh, some computer stores. And one of my business partners called me one day and said, there's an issue with this person and they had been hit. And what we found out is, is when they get hit, any business should, for all intents and purposes, call the FBI. And let them know we've been hit. Okay, you know, and when you say for for those who don't understand, when you've been hit, what does exactly that mean? That means someone was able to hack into your computers, right, or your server, right, and encrypt the data, meaning it's not usable at all. Okay, they're destroying it. They don't destroy it. What they do is is they write a program that turns it into a format that only they can unlock it with a reverse program. Oh, okay. 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 And so, All right. um, depending on how old their stuff is, um, I don't really want to mention any place that it comes from, but there are third world countries and, and mm -hmm. some powerhouse countries that they have people that that's all they do all day long is they just sit and they seek. They find a loophole in your system and they get in and they'll plant something and it could be months before it activates. Hmm. So they'll plant something in there to, to encrypt uh, and then th somebody won't know it for months. Right. And then all of a sudden, uh, but we're talking big companies, are we, you're not talking individuals, right? We're talking anywhere from one to two users all the way up to mega, mega users. Um, what, like, uh, why would one or two, two users, what good is it for them to? One of the most common misconceptions about data hacking mm -hmm. and ransomware mm -hmm. is that they know where they're hacking into. A lot of times they don't. Oh. What they will do is they will look for an IP address, okay? Which if you don't have a firewall in your business, you need to get one because they're mm -hmm. not very expensive. They'll protect your data and they'll protect you from hackers in the outside world. Mm. Um, and so uh, with that, you have, um, you've got the hackers that come in, they'll plant a seed, they'll change the data, but they don't really know if you're a one person company or a 50 person. Really? Yeah, they just go after. Now, like they do at times target companies such as law firms, medical their biggest two targets are medical and law firms. Mm -hmm. And then if they happen to catch a manufacturing, the first case that we worked on was a manufacturing company in Detroit. Hmm. And we were able to retrieve all their data, get them all back up and running. And from that day forward, we started backing up their uh, information on our systems. Mm -hmm. And, but we'd never, you know, we, we didn't know them before that as far as what they did. But, then after that, we started getting calls and, uh, you know, one company in Murfreesboro that we worked with uh, here in Middle Tennessee, uh, they had been hit three times. And mm. the first time, it destroyed a whole lot of data. The second time, we had taken over, 
doing their backups, but we weren't really taking over their IT systems. And then the third time that they got hit, somebody there clicked on a link that gave them an open door. So another thing is, is if you get uh, something that's really helpful with people is, let's just say you get a PDF file, Adobe PDF or any other PDF version, and you get it in your email. Always check with the person that sent it and make Mm. certain that it's legitimate because a lot of times those will have links in them. Mm -hmm. And when you click on it, boom, it activates, it goes out and it gives them, oh, here's an IP address. We've just created an open door or a portal for you. We're going to come in, plant our seed and either encrypt it right now or just put our little beacon in there that says, here's an open place you can come into. And then it could be a week, a month you know, yeah. six months, but then all of a sudden you'll come in one day and go, what happened? And, you know, everything is gone. So the, so does your, when you come in and what happened, does that mean you open up and you don't have anything on your computer? Uh, for the most part, you do have it. it everything is there. Right. But when you double click on it to open a file, right. it'll say this file. Usually it comes up with a box with a message and it'll say this file has been encrypted and you need to email this guy or email this ad, you know, address, and they'll tell you how much it's going to cost you to get your data back. Wow, scary. It is. Um, it is the most rampant, and we thought that it was going to maybe slow down a little bit, but we were very wrong. It is still surging, you know, every day. I can't remember the actual logistics of it or the, 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 the um, numbers, but on a daily basis, it increases incredibly. And, you know, now they're going after different things, creating different problems, uh, you know, for the computers. But um, Mm -hmm. my home computer was hit uh, probably six years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is why I say it's important that even though you have Comcast and Comcast says, oh, no, that modem that we put in there is safe. It's a firewall. It's not. Ah. And you can get what they call a Soho, small office home office firewall, they're not very expensive, but they're well worth it. And that keeps out the blockers, you know, from everything. Uh, We recommend that if you work remote uh, from home and into an office, Mm -hmm. that you have your IT department uh, set up a VPN connection. What does that mean? VPN VPN is what they call a virtual private network. And that means that nobody can see your traffic between your desktop at home and your desktop at work. And so it's kind of like, yeah, you're out on the web, but you are also invisible. Hmm. Nobody can track those numbers. Um, a, another unique thing is there is one uh, that you can buy for personal computers. Now, when I travel, um, I have a bad habit of just seeing if anybody's computers are unprotected in the hotel. And ah. I don't click on them or go to them because that's wrong. But some of these computers are just using the hotel's free internet. Right. And a bad person could very easily go in, double click on your computer and delete all your data and you would never know it. Wow. Um, So what we recommend is get, and if you Google them, you'll find them all over the place, uh, but there's one called NordVPN and Nord sends your data out and nobody can see anything you're doing on the internet. Hmm. What's unique about it is, is a lot of people, they'll go, oh, you know what? When I get to the hotel tonight, I got to pay my bills and I got to do this research and do that and whatever. And or if they're going down to, you know, Panera or, or Starbucks or, you know, the local coffee shop, anywhere there's a public Wi-Fi, you should be using a VPN connection. And the reason for that is it protects and blocks. The bad thing about this, and if you're taking notes on this, the one thing you want to do is, if you try to go to your bank's website yeah. and you can't get there, it'll come up and it might say, this bank is restricted to IP addresses only in this country or only in the United States. And what happens is a lot of times these VPN connections will send you to a server that's in the UK or China or Russia or wherever in the world, and that's where they'll bounce your internet signal to. And so what is happening is you try to go to your website and you can't get to your bank 
and you start flipping out because, oh my goodness, something is going on. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, they try to uh, uh, block that. The other thing is um, with VPN connections, um, always close them out when you're done. Always close them, lock them down, um, you know. And there's one, uh, there's a browser, an internet browser called Opera. So you've got Microsoft Edge, you've got Google Chrome. If you're a Mac person, you've got um, Safari. But there's one out there called um, Opera. And Opera has a VPN built into it, a VPN mode. So when you click it, all of your web browsing is hidden. And Mm. it can't see where you're going. The problem with that is it is quicker. They use a lot of off-site servers out of country. Mm. And it might be in Costa Rica or or wherever it's cheap Mm. to have a data center. And so part of that is, uh, part of the problem is that um, you have to turn that VPN off. And then that will put you back in the United States. Hmm. So, well, most people have no idea. I mean, I don't even know what a VPN is. So, uh, most people don't know this. And I know that uh, you helped a, a, a friend of mine when uh, he had entities invade his computer and he needed firewalls and all that. But the the, the regular folks out there, you think, oh, they, they, why would they want to get little old me? You know. Uh, but you're saying that even if you're the one and two people can be invaded by, by uh, yes. these these, like whoever they are. Right. Uh, one of the biggest scams out there, and we try to broadcast this to everybody, is you'll be working on your computer, and all of a sudden you'll get a screen come up, and it'll say, "You have been uh, compromised. Your system has been compromised. Please call Microsoft at this number." That is not real in any way, shape, or form. Uh Do not call Microsoft. Do not call Microsoft. Because they are not at that number. And what happens is, is you call them, and then they get access to your computer, and then they make your computer full of problems. And so what you want to do is, immediately, if you get that pop-up, just simply power off your computer. And when you come back on, they'll be gone. And just remember which website you went to and try to avoid that website. Wow. Save you thousands of dollars. Wow. Wow. So what gain do they get from that? What is it? Um, What are they getting? If it's through the Microsoft Air, it is a subscription. So they're getting money. They'll ask you, well, here, in order for us to fix this, it's going to cost you $400 $400 or $800 or $1,000, uh, depending on who you talk to. So just give us your credit card number, and it's going to take us about an hour, and we'll get it all fixed. And I heard that they wanted gift cards. Yes, as... they want payment in gift cards Yeah, because they're not trackable. Okay, so if somebody's saying pay us in gift cards, not a good thing, right? No, run. Turn that computer off. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you were mentioning the FBI, if they... If there is a uh, somebody is invaded, an FBI will come and investigate, but they won't do anything. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, they their hands are somewhat tied. I mean, they can do uh, what the FBI can do. They're a phenomenal organization, but they leave the fixing to the professional fixers, mm-hmm. and they do the investigation and write the reports. Their job and what they want to know is where is this coming from? How did they get in? You know, did you open a link? Uh, did you not have a firewall? Did you? They do an investigation. Mm-hmm. And then after they're done, they don't have guys that come in and sit down and fix it. They call firms, and those firms come in and consult. And like your firm, yes. uh, call you, and you can help fix it. Right. We, yeah. we try to find their weaknesses, and, you know, if, it's a, if they need a firewall or stronger passwords... You know, the worst password in the world is password. (laughs) And people use it all the time. Oh, let's try the password. (laughs) Yes. You get the password or password. Wow. And and you think, you know, that's the first thing I would try. Wow. uh, Wow. Well, of course, in, in addition to this cybersecurity, which you're an expert at, 
And on the credits, we're going to say the name of your company because it's hard to find somebody as good as you to do this kind of work. Uh, the, you have other interests, which uh, I believe uh, music has been in your life from uh, jazz, playing at churches, and uh, playing trumpets. And you have a collection of trumpets. I, I t <laughs> yes, I tend to <laughs> find trumpets and uh, and saxophones. And I didn't really, you know, uh, the funny story is I went to an auction uh, a couple of years ago and I got a really good deal on a saxophone. And I brought it home <clears throat> and I put it in the closet. And so huh. two years went by and I never opened it. Hmm. Didn't even know it was in there. And so I was like a kid at Christmas because I was cleaning out my horn. I was looking for one of my horns and I started laying them all out on the bed and I realized I don't know what this horn is. So I unzip it and I open it all up and I am thrilled to death thinking, hey, where did this come from? You hmm. know, and uh, I collect um, vintage trumpets and uh, uh, some of them I'll keep and some I resell. Wow, vintage yeah. trumpets. Wow. And also, a whole other world is the um, digital coins. Right. And that's something I know nothing about. I know people, friends of mine, who've made a lot of money and lost a lot of money. And uh, it, it's very intriguing that you know so much about it. And you're going to be, I didn't understand if you're doing right now or going to be doing a podcast. And we are. T t tell us about that so our audience can know how they can tune in. What we're doing is we're creating a podcast for beginners because a lot of people want to get involved in the digital currency market and they hear about everybody that's making money. We have made uh, really good money in digital currency. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted everybody else to see what I see and understand and invest. Mm -hmm. um, it is a couple of things. Number one, it's a very volatile market. And that means uh, the volatility is at one minute it may be worth a dollar and two hours later it may be worth $300. Mm. It just goes up and down. Mm. Um, I have invested in things like Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, and a large number of tokens or currencies as we call them. Mm. And uh, some of them, I've seen them recently. There was a big buy on a, a token called Shiba, S-H-I-B-A. Mm. And everybody got in and it went through the roof. Mm. Um, and so when it did, we sold off our profits, but we left our investment in. And so it tanked or crashed. And a lot of people that didn't get out when it was topped, they lost a lot of money. Ooh. And so it's very volatile on an hourly basis. So mm. you have to track it, but there's some good things is, oh. for instance, our next currency, I fully believe is gonna be what they call Ethereum. Oh. Um, it has recently been open for trade on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Mm. And so it's getting a lot of recognition and they're coming out now with something called Ethereum 2. And uh, Ethereum, when you log in, you can look at the internet, just type it in, and it'll show you the maps of mm -hmm. how it's going up and up and mm -hmm. up the graphs. Mm -hmm. And so with that, you, uh, there's a whole lot of them. And what we're doing is we're creating uh, a three time a week uh, email and text. And with that email and text, we're going to send out tips and say, you need to buy this today. Okay. And at this time, and then we'll tell you when to sell. And so we're going to pull some of the stress out of investing out of it. Hmm. Now, is this something that you want to cancel your Roth IRA or your 401k? Absolutely not. No. Leave those in place. Because it ha it's very risky, right? It is very risky. Uh, they hmm. have a new thing out called NFTs. And NFTs hmm. is even more volatile. Um, I was listening to a gentleman hmm. talk yesterday at a summit and he was talking about how much money he made and then how much he lost in NFTs oh. within a matter of about six hours. Oh he my lost, goodness. it was close to a hundred thousand. Whoa. Yes. And so you've got to be very, very careful. Um, but we we're not coming in with any professional advice. We are coming in with uh, a strong amount of uh, 
here's what we're doing. Okay, if you want this to follow is what us, we're doing. Exactly. We're not, no guarantees. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And that protects us and it gives you the opportunity. We want people to learn this because the currency market is absolutely going to change. Hmm. The dollar is going to change over the next few years. Wow. And those that are prepared who have invested into the currency market, I think they're going to be less apt to be nervous mm -hmm. um, with, you know, the changes that come to uh, the financial mm -hmm. markets. And then is that podcast now happening or will be? It will be. Uh, as far as we know, it is airing the first time next Today's Friday, next Wednesday or Thursday. I believe it's next Wednesday. And how can people access it? Uh, on our card mm -hmm. is my email address. Okay, and we're going to put that in the credits. Yeah. And if they want to send me an email and say we're interested, um, okay. they can do that. And I'll be glad to uh, send them some information. And basically, they get connected. They get access to our hmm. personal uh, YouTube, not, yeah, YouTube Live. Um, okay. We're going to be doing um, YouTube every, or Facebook Live and YouTube Live every, I think we're doing once every week or every other week. Okay. And we're doing one on the crypto market, mm -hmm. and then we're doing one on the uh, technology market. A mm -hmm. lot of new uh, upcoming technologies that are coming out. Uh, for the last eight years or nine years, I mm -hmm. did uh, a ton uh, I was the go-to for technology for the Tennessee Bar Association. Right. And I did CLEs for them all the time. And so what we're doing is we're taking that knowledge and now we're bringing it into our own and offering it you know, to a lot of people. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing. So it seems that, uh, I mean, everything from cybersecurity to the, uh, the digital currency, uh, and then you collect... Uh, musical instruments and uh, it's uh, amazing how many different areas uh, the music part and the technical part and it's all mixed around and you're still performing too at churches and all that kind of thing yeah. and uh, raising the family and all that it's, uh, yes it's, it's a joy it sounds like an amazing um, variation of many things and then we'll, uh, I know so many people want it, like me, who know nothing about the, the digital coin world. Uh, I don't understand. I started, started to see advertising on it. But uh, So, uh, Ben, I want to thank you so much for being on our show. You really opened my eyes to so many different things I never even thought about. So right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, transitions, body, mind, spirit. Thank you. All right. All right. It's a wrap.